All right, good evening everybody. I'm Mike Graham, I'm the Director of Technology uh, here at Hemfield. And uh, with me over on the side there is Jeremy Paul, our Assistant Director of Technology. Um, you're all here, I'm guessing, to uh, learn a little bit more about our one-to-one -one program. Um, just a quick show of hands, how many of a uh, middle schooler next year in seventh grade? And um, upcoming fourth grader? And any first, first graders? Oh, we've got a lot of first graders, okay. So, um, we're going to be sharing, uh, this is really a broad presentation about the, uh, the, whole, the program as a whole. Um, most of the information pretty much applies um, across the board to all different grade levels. Um, but there'll be a couple pieces here and there that are a little bit different for first grade. Uh, simply because some of the details on how things are going to uh, roll out there are a little bit different uh, than the other grade levels. Uh, but uh, thank you all for coming uh, again tonight. We're glad, uh, glad to see everybody here. Uh, hopefully you find this um, uh, good information and uh, kind of prepares you for, uh, for what's coming for next year. Uh, so one of the first uh, things that we always start uh, presentations off with, with one-to-one, -one, uh, is to talk a little bit about the why of, of why we're doing this in the first place. Uh, and one of the things that's not actually on this slide or the, the next one was some of the reasons, but it's also something we, we kind of like to mention up front, um, is that this isn't a, a replacement for traditional teaching. This is not a tool. Uh, it's not a device that's going to be used 24-7. It's not going to be used 100% of the time in the classroom. Uh, technology is another tool in a teacher's toolbox. Uh, it's a tool that's very powerful. You can do a lot of uh, very cool stuff with it. Um, a lot of really great learning resources on it. Uh, but it is not the, the be-all, end-all um, teaching and learning resource. Uh, so if you walk into a fourth grade uh, classroom today, uh, you'll definitely see a mix of uh, more traditional um, instructional methods as well as some, uh, some much more up-to-date ones with, uh, with the iPads. Uh, so I always like to kind of start that off just to, um, to set the stage for things uh, because what we're really talking about here is really expanding uh, the opportunities for, uh, for learning, expanding the tools that are out there. Uh, and enhancing the instruction uh, and how um, teachers are uh, teaching here at Hemfield. Uh, some of the bullet points up on the screen here behind me, uh, you've probably heard about uh, in one way or another if you've ever uh, read up or read anything on one-to-one uh, -one programs. Uh, that equal access to learning tools for students from all different uh, demographics and backgrounds, uh, really trying to level the playing field for what students have access to, uh, both inside and outside of the classroom. Uh, being able to do more um, critical thinking, more up-to-date uh, examples, more up-to-date resources, uh, and extending the learning experiences beyond the classroom. Uh, you'll see a little bit later on um, one of the key applications uh, that we're going to show you, um, Schoology, if you're not familiar with it. Um, it's, it's one of the, uh, the kind of the, the main components of our one-to-one -one program uh, and is really designed to, to take a lot of the resources uh, that students use during the school day uh, here at Hemfield, but make the, all of those resources available outside of school as well, uh, which is something that we all we haven't always been able to do in the past. Um, textbooks, making things more interactive, more engaging. Uh, we have seen that in fourth grade already uh, with the, the first year of the program here. Um, more direct, directed learning, more uh, differentiated instruction, uh, more real-time resources. Uh, and one device that can serve multiple subjects. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the professional development uh, that uh, our teachers have been going through. One of the, um, the key features or um, uh, main uh, areas that we, uh, we focused on during professional development is that this is not just uh, a device for the core subject areas. This is a device, uh, something, technology that can really be used in any subject area. So uh, when we go, went through uh, professional development, we covered all your areas, not just the cores, we covered specials, uh, everything, math, uh, art, PE even, uh, special ed, gifted, uh, you name it. Uh, we wanted to make sure that this is a tool that could really be used in all areas for all students. Um, one of the, uh, the key takeaways, if you ever hear uh, Dr. Adams speak about uh, the mission and vision for, this, uh, for Hemfield, uh, is that as a school system, our goal, or one of our main jobs, uh, is not just to prepare students to survive when they graduate, uh, but really so that they can thrive out in the 21st century, that they can fully use all of the tools that are out there responsibly, effectively, uh, no matter what path that they take. Uh, and if you, uh, if you go to the, the district website, uh, either to the one-to-one -one, uh, page, the link is there, uh, or go to our YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Adams has a, um, it's about a 45-minute video up there from one of the parents' partners 
uh, sessions that took place uh, back in February of last year. Uh, and he spends about 45 minutes in there uh, going through, talking about all of the whys of why we really want to look at this uh, in much greater depth than, than what I'm doing here this evening. Uh, but if you have a chance, take a, um, uh, take a trip out to YouTube and watch that. Uh, it's some good background material and really goes into um, the whys that we're, of what we're uh, trying to do here. The, uh, the one to one program here at Hemfield uh, is not something new. It's certainly something that's been talked about for quite a while. Um, about three years ago, I think at least at this point, uh, the district's uh, comprehensive planning committee, uh, which was made up of uh, administrators, school board members, uh, community members, parents, uh, local business leaders, uh, and even some student input, um, just kind of sat down and put together the state's or the school district's comprehensive plan, uh, which uh, we're mandated to do by the state. It, it requires us to take a look at um, the needs of the district where. Uh, the community feels that the district needs to go. Uh, it's about 120 pages long. Uh, it's great reading. Um, but uh, one of those uh, strategies, or excuse me, one of those uh, goals, number one, uh, was uh, the district will implement a consistent research-based uh, assessment and instructional practices in all classrooms. Uh, and one of the specific strategies for achieving that goal uh, was put in there as the, the district will implement a K-12 one-to-one program. Uh, the uh, technology came out very strongly in all of the feedback from uh, all of those stakeholders that were in that uh, comprehensive planning committee. Uh, that uh, they, they all felt that technology integration was something very important, something that Hemfield was already doing uh, well, but really wanted to expand on to expand the resources available to students. Um, so that plan was voted on by the school board. It went into effect, uh, I think it's now been two years ago. Uh, and so that's really been the, um, the, the guiding document for a lot of the things that the district does, uh, including the one-to-one -one program. Um, another group uh, that was kind of working separately around the same time, maybe a little bit later, uh, was the Technology Task Force. Uh, this group was kind of composed of similar, uh, similar members. Uh, we had uh, some school board, still have some school board members, uh, administrators, representatives from technology, curriculum, uh, and the Hemfield Foundation as well. Uh, this group really was uh, focused on what does it take to put together um, a one-to-one -one program within the district. Uh, knowing that, again, coming from the comprehensive plan, it needed to be uh, K-12 through and it really needed to t uh, target a number of different areas. Uh, and so that group uh, looked at the eight areas that are kind of listed there at the bottom, uh, ranging from the mission and vision uh, to how do we deploy everything, uh, financing, how do we pay for it, the infrastructure to make it all work, how do we train teachers? How do we um, get content out to, uh, to students? Uh, how do we measure success? And how do we involve um, parents and uh, the rest of the community with everything? So that group uh, really spent a lot of time going through, uh, looking at uh, all of those different uh, areas. And that's kind of how the, the plan formulated that um, we're in the process of implementing today. Uh, that, the final presentation from the Tech Task Force uh, was done back in December of um, 2014, I think, maybe somewhere around there. Um, and then uh, that led to the following uh, school year in the 15-16 school year, uh, fourth grade starting uh, with one-to-one. -one. Uh, so what does the implementation plan look like? That's, uh, that's really um, one of the first questions that we've always been asked, uh, how to address it. Um, and uh, picking a starting grade level was something that the Tech Task Force, again, uh, kind of wrestled with, talked a lot about. Um, if, you, uh, if you think about a lot of the one-to-one -one programs uh, that are out there, and um, that's another kind of good point to mention, um, within uh, IE 13, which is Lancaster and Lebanon counties, um, at the time that we started our one-to-one, -one, uh, around 40 to 45 percent of other school districts in those two counties had already started a one-to-one -one program. Uh, and the other, um, I want to say, uh, 40 or so percent uh, were basically in the planning stages to, uh, to bring one online. Uh, and really at this point, I think there's only about two districts out of the entire, out of both counties that haven't started a one-to-one -one program. But um, knowing, that, uh, knowing we wanted to get something rolling, uh, the Tech Task Force spent a lot of time thinking about how do we roll this out, knowing we want it to be a K-12 program. Uh, and. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is, is certainly the size of our high school. Uh, if you look at the other one-to-one -one programs that are out there, uh, they typically do start in a high school, uh, simply because uh, if you go back many, many years, uh, technology and integration into instruction has really always been focused uh, a lot at the secondary level, the 
the Classrooms for the Future grant, uh, which came from the state um, probably eight, eight or more years ago, uh, was mainly focused at secondary. Now here at Hempfield, we've always included elementary uh, to an extent, but secondary in a lot of districts has gotten a lot of the attention for one-to-one. -one. Again, with the size of our high school, uh, we didn't feel that starting with 2,200 students right off the bat uh, with a huge number of teachers was really uh, a good place to begin. Uh, and so what we, uh, we, we kind of tossed around some of the other grade levels, the middle school, um, before we really ended up with fourth grade. Uh, and uh, there's a couple things that I'll talk a little bit later about. Uh, one of them, though, uh, is a three-year replacement cycle for devices. Um, and uh, that was another uh, key feature we looked at is we didn't want to end up with uh, hardware uh, in students' hands that was so old that you couldn't do anything with it. Uh, and so we ultimately ended up with a um, a, a three-year replacement cycle for devices, which means a student gets uh, a device in first, fourth, seventh, and tenth grade. They keep it for three years, after which that device, uh, we take them back, uh, sell them off at market value. That money goes back into uh, the replacement cycle, um, and then uh, the students issued a new device in that grade level, uh, or in their next grade. Uh, so fourth grade uh, and seventh were certainly uh, two areas that we looked at closely. Uh, we ultimately uh, decided to go with fourth grade, um, just based on a, a couple random factors, but we felt it was a good way to start. Uh, elementaries uh, are often not starting places for one-to-one, -one, but uh, in talking with a number of other districts, which the, uh, the Tech Task Force did, um, a lot of districts who didn't start with elementary that we talked to said if they could do it all over again, they would start in elementary. Uh, it's, it's generally a, a much easier place to begin with. Um, it's, it's easier to, to introduce the technology, work out the bugs before uh, it really gets hit hard um, once you get up to the, the secondary levels. Uh, so with that three-year replacement cycle in mind, uh, the next year uh, we wanted to bring on more grade levels. Uh, so seventh uh, was the next one and then also uh, we, we debated for a while on what to do with the primary level, uh, but fourth grade uh, is the next grade level uh, that we added there as well. The other major challenge that, that we still have yet to tackle, or, or we know how we're going to do it, but uh, we delayed it until the third year, uh, was bringing the entire high school online. As I mentioned, we've got a huge high school, um, and we really need to bring that entire building on at the same time. Uh, if you think about it, outside of, or after you get past ninth grade, uh, most of the classes, or a lot of the classes that students are in, are, in, are mixed grade levels. Uh, and so bringing on one of those grade levels, or two of those grade levels, uh, really puts teachers at a disadvantage and puts some students at a disadvantage if you're mixing up uh, who has a device and who doesn't. Uh, so the whole high school we knew had to come online at the same time, but we didn't want to do it at the beginning, uh, which kind of led to that being in the third year of implementation. So if you look at the chart up there, uh, we've already begun with fourth grade. Uh, next year we're bringing on first uh, and seventh, and obviously new fourth graders, which is why all of you are here. Um, and then uh, the following year, the whole high school is online uh, along with your seventh graders who have now moved on to eighth grade. Um, likewise, first to second and uh, fourth grade to fifth grade as well. Um, kindergarten, uh, we do also have some plans for kindergarten. Uh, again, um, this uh, kindergarten is uh, kind of added on there uh, in the last year of implementation. Uh, we really didn't want to rush into to doing anything uh, down there. We wanted to take our time to really think through what that looks like at that grade level. Um, as I mentioned before, at the very start of this um, technology, we, we encourage it to be fit in and integrated where it makes sense, and not just to use it for technology's sake. Uh, and we wanted to spend a good bit of time working with teachers um, to figure out what's an appropriate use uh, down there, what are the appropriate apps, the amount of screen time, things like that. Um, particularly with the way kindergarten is set up with AM and PM, uh, we really wanted to work out the details down there uh, before we, we got going. So, uh, any, any questions on the implementation, the background uh, so far? Feel free to jump in and interrupt if you have questions too. I don't know. Okay. Um, so, with that implementation plan in mind, um, we, uh, we kind of got into uh, the budgeting and finance, how we were going to pay for all of this. Uh, and there's two separate pieces here. One of them is insurance, which uh, is probably one of the bigger questions you came here tonight. But, uh, one of the other ones that the school board obviously was, was very keen in, in looking at was how are we going to pay for this. Um, primarily, the, the one to one is financed uh, through reallocating money that we already had in our budget uh, for uh, technology, things like laptop carts, computer labs, um, other money that is um, already spent on curriculum. We think about retooling some of those resources towards more electronic resources. 
um, supplies and some other locations throughout the budget. Uh, in addition there, um, uh, that resale uh, value after three years that I mentioned, that money eventually comes back in and kind of feeds into that replacement cycle as well. Uh, the board was very adamant um, that um, parents and students have the option to, uh, to buy uh, that iPad or that device uh, at the end of the three years. Um, so in about, well, in two more years, uh, we're going to be having uh, a sale from then on of pretty much all of those devices as they go off uh, prior to us selling them off to a, uh, a recycling company to get that, um, to get that refund. We'll be doing that uh, every year in about two years. Uh, the other main piece with uh, finances and money uh, that was looked at was insurance. Uh, and uh, we looked at a number of different models, again, looking at a lot of different districts that have done one-to-ones around here. Um, tech fees, insurance fees, whatever you want to call them, uh, range from nothing uh, that we saw in a few districts uh, all the way up to, um, I think, about 60 or $70 per student per year, uh, which pretty much everybody on the committee felt was totally unreasonable. Uh, and so what we ended up with was the $30 per year per student. Uh, so just to, to, to back up a minute here before I explain that, um, the, the one to one program here at Hemfield, uh, there's really two pieces of it. Uh, the first is the district is providing the technology for every student in the district, uh, regardless of any uh, insurance fees or anything like that. It's just another resource, uh, like a textbook, like a desk, it's another resource that the district is providing to every student to use in school throughout the day. Uh, the take home piece is kind of where the insurance fee comes in. If you wish to participate and have the iPad uh, go home with your child, uh, the, the prerequisite for that is the insurance fee that basically covers damage, content filtering, and everything like that. Uh, so there isn't a requirement uh, that the iPad goes home or anything like that, um, but if you do wish to participate in the take-home portion, that's where the tech fee comes in. Um, so that's, uh, again, what we set there was $30 per year per student. Uh, right now there's a family cap of 90 uh, if you have multiple kids, uh, but again, uh, that's still something the uh, board members were discussing within the technology task force. Uh, what that covers uh, beyond uh, content filtering and some other software that goes into it um, is the first $50 in damage uh, for two incidents. Uh, and so if you think about an iPad, um, probably the first thing that comes to mind is the screen, and that's definitely the, the most likely thing that's going to be broken on a device uh, or on an iPad. Um, now, we're not uh, the vendor, or not, we're not the guy in the little kiosk outside of the Apple store at Park City. Um, our goal is not to make a profit off of this. Our goal isn't to pay rent. Um, our goal is to repair the iPad and get it turned around as quickly as possible. Um, so again, if you think about um, a cracked screen, the glass on the top getting cracked, um, that's really only about a $20 repair for us to do. Uh, that's all it is. Um, if you uh, if, you, if you crack it a little bit deeper, if you get down past the glass into the, um, uh, the sensors that pick up your fingerprints um, that are on there that interpret the touch, uh, then it's only somewhere around $45 to $50 to repair. Um, so that uh, $50 in damage uh, basically covers um, pretty much anything uh, that you could think of doing to this device short of bending it in half or dropping it um, in the bathtub. Um, so. Uh, damage really has not been a, a major issue this year. We've had no one um, that's had multiple uh, incidents of damage uh, beyond that uh, and had to repay the entire cost. Uh, we've had, um, I have another slide on this a little bit later, but really uh, out of the 500 uh, iPads that we have um, out there now, 96% 96, 96 of them have gone home uh, and we've had, I think, less than 10 incidents of any sort of damage at all. Um, the, uh, the iPads, whether they go home or not, uh, all get um, an OtterBox case on them. Uh, we include that. Uh, it's a special EDU model. It's the one I'm holding here. Um, it's got a clear back, uh, basically a front. Uh, it doesn't have a flip cover. Uh, we had looked at some of those. Basically, the covers all get lost about halfway through the year, and there's not really much point to, uh, to sending them out. Um, the stands, if any of you remember back in the 80s and 90s, the, the slap bracelets, uh, that's basically how the stands work. They flip out and just uh, go down like that. Um, so again, uh, we've had real good luck with, uh, or I shouldn't say luck, we've had very good experience with uh, damage and repairs this year. Um, again, aside from uh, one that was submerged in water and uh, mom shared with us that it was 
uh, in the bathroom, so we're really hoping it was the bathtub and not the toilet. Um, again, if, it, uh, if it's submerged in water, there's not much we can do. And uh, we, we do have a uh, kind of a, a payment process that goes into that. We, we reduce um, the uh, insurance fee off of the, the final end cost uh, for the iPad. So you, you really don't end up paying the full retail price if the whole thing is destroyed. But really, any other type of damage uh, we're able to, uh, to kind of cover in that $30 per year uh, insurance fee. Uh, and again, uh, that's really only a prerequisite if it's going to go home. If your child's just going to be using it in school, um, there is no additional fees or payments or anything like that. Um, from the district's perspective, uh, we'd strongly encourage you to, to um, participate in the program to, uh, to have the iPad go home. A lot of the tools uh, that you're going to see later on here uh, in Schoology especially are accessible on a number of different devices, whether it's web browsers, another iPad, um, but really a lot of the benefit comes from a student having the same device all the time that they can really use for all of their work. Uh, to basically act as an electronic notebook, an electronic binder, if you think about it that way, um, that they can access everything on. Yes? What if the child already has an iPad home? If you have one at home, you can load Schoology on, you can load any of the apps they're going to use, um, and you can do probably everything except for transfer some of the files back and forth. But even there, there's some ways to do it. Um, we, we have had people ask, can my child bring in, bring in their personal iPad and use it at school? And uh, at this point, the answer is no. Um, one of the main reasons is um, uh, when we're pushing out software, licensed software, uh, that the district has bought and paid for, we have no way to do that if it's a personal device. We can only do that uh, if it's a district-owned iPad. Uh, so that's one of the, the main challenges there. Um, one of the other issues, too, is um, if that happens, uh, there's certain legal issues uh, with with search and, re and reasonable suspicion that if it's a district-owned device, we're held to. If it's a personal device, it becomes a little blurrier, uh, which, again, at the elementary level, not as much of a deal, but when you start getting into secondary, um, there's more cases where we still want to be able to have some control over the data that's on there um, for discipline issues and things like that. Um, that's not to say it'll never happen, um, but at this point, it's still only the district device that you can it also allows our devices to be refreshed every three years and have know that we can run the latest iOS on them and still be fully functional yes. with apps. If we don't want our first grader to have the iPad bringing it home, will that negatively impact their ability to get assignments done? And no, and and we'll get into um, we'll get into that um, later when Jeremy kind of shows off Schoology. But a lot of the materials, the program, this whole program was really designed. Um, to uh, deliver a lot of the instruction electronically through either cloud services, web services, things like that. That's not to say that the iPad doesn't play an important role in kind of keeping tabs on everything, accessing the device, uh, or accessing those materials. One of the other challenges is that we've all, always or often seen is uh, there may be a family computer at home, but there's only one computer for multiple kids, and then you get into to sharing and, and things like that. Um, so. Will you be negatively hindered? I would say probably not significantly, um, but you're certainly going to get some benefit from having it at home. Um, one of the other applications that, again, I'll, we'll, we'll get to later, um, the district's ebook library, uh, full uh, electronic library of books is accessible on the district um, iPads. It's a little more iffy if you're talking about a personal device as well. So there's some extra reading materials that if you want to have additional access to beyond the school day, it's going to be easier with the district device. Um, that said, with, uh, with first grade in particular, this is one of those um, areas where it's going to be a little bit different than other grade levels. Um, our first grade teachers have been very mindful about, or at least have been certainly discussing, is it something that has to go home every day? Or do we, you know, is it, is it um, more, do we, we purposely schedule some gaps in between there so the iPad's not going home every day? Because that's really one of the, the primary parent concerns that we've heard that we've been talking about is screen time and making sure it's, it's not you know, they're not you know, focused on that device all the time when they go home. So um, I think you'll see that a lot more in, in first grade, that it's um, probably not quite as heavily ingrained as the, the upper grade levels. But I think you're going to see the first grade teachers do a lot of really creative projects as well. I would agree 100 percent. I mean, our first grade teachers uh, have actually gone through uh, training here in the last month and are really excited and seeing a lot of opportunity for use of the devices. Um, but you know, I would agree along those lines too. 
uh, from the first grade side of things, the devices won't be available to go home day one or even the first month or two uh, as they're settling in and getting used to you know, going to school a full day and getting into their first grade classrooms and you know, getting used to uh, getting settled down in those classrooms and getting used to the routines and stuff they need to. Um, we've talked to first grade teachers and we're actually going to delay the, um, you know, the, the access to those iPads uh, probably into to mid-October to late October uh, to at least get those into the classrooms at that point. So still working through finalizing the, that time frame, but it's looking like uh, October, early November, around there. And what we would do at that point, if you do want to participate, we'd probably prorate the insurance fee based on the, the time period of the year, if it's, if it's trimester two uh, that we start on uh, down there. So. We've also had discussions, too, for students that don't have internet at home. Uh, if they are taking that device home, there's ways that they can actually download the information that they need on that device so that when they go home, they have everything they need on the iPad itself. Um, so we've had, you know, a lot of discussions in our training about that, uh, as well as, you know, making available other opportunities if a device is not going home. Um, if a student has a machine at home, how they can access those materials, or if they're not taking it home and don't have a device at home, how they can access materials or take materials home with them as well. So. Um, how about non-damage type issues, you know, like the things that are sluggish or it's just not working right? Do you guys help out with yes, that? Yes, um, tech there? support. I'm it's all on the parent now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tech support, uh, I'm going to talk about probably in about okay. two slides, so I'll, we can, we'll, I'll hit on that then. Um, anything else? So there, yep. If the student damages the iPad at school, there, it doesn't count against them. Um, if it's damaged at school, and I have a fantastic picture I'll show you here of some school damage um, in a little bit. Um, if it happens at school, it doesn't count against um, the, the two thing. If they do pay the insurance fee, uh, we treat it just like any other you know, damage to a book or something like that. Now, if it's completely malicious and they stab their pencil right through the screen, we have another conversation. But um, if it just falls off the desk or something like that, we, we just repair it. We just treat that as the cost of doing business. Yeah, it's the insurance system we were very happy with. It's worked out well this year. Um, uh, the damage we have had, it's, it's been covered, and everybody seems to have uh, like they're dealt with it pretty well. Any other damage questions? Again, this is one of the, the main ones that everybody always is curious about. OK. Uh, device selection. How did we get to the iPad, which is another another common question. We looked at. Excuse uh, me. Oh, Just sorry. before you got off that one, yep. you had theft on there. Yes. Just, I mean, because not all kids within a school are going to have them. If something happens that it's left in a classroom and it's in a desk and all of a sudden one goes missing, yep. who is responsible so, for that? So, um, the iPads are, tell you what, let me get to, I'm going to kind of talk a lot about that in okay. two slides. Okay. Um, so, before I get ahead of myself, yeah, we do talk a lot about theft and, okay. and tracking and things like that in another slide or two here. Um, any, anything else for damage? Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about theft in a, in a minute here. Uh, device selection, um, why we picked the iPad. We looked at um, a bunch of different options that were out there. We looked at full-blown laptops, uh, which a couple districts have done around here, uh, Windows laptops, convertibles, Microsoft Surface. Uh, we looked at uh, Penn Matters Linux uh, program they're running over there, Chromebooks. Uh, we looked at Android tablets and even down to, uh, to Nooks, Kindles, and some other miscellaneous devices uh, that you can probably think of. Uh, and all of those were really um, kind of judged against uh, those criteria over there on the right. Um, it needed to be a multifunction device that you could use in, in all different areas. Uh, it had to have great software support, uh, widely, uh, widely available educational software. Uh, good battery life, it had to be something that would last uh, throughout a school day without any trouble, without any question. Um, but we also wanted the device to be pers uh, personalizable. We wanted students to be able to feel like it was their device and not just a, uh, a district laptop that they grabbed out of the cart. It needed to be able to, uh, to really kind of become theirs. That, that ownership piece uh, is something that came up uh, a lot in a lot of our research. Uh, ownership is really one of those key factors that reduces um, damage and loss. Uh, and that the more the student feels that it's their device, uh, the less likely, or the, I should say the more likely, uh, it is that they're going to take care of it uh, and, and treat it well for the, uh, the duration of time that they have it. Uh, Cost-wise, uh, looking for somewhere in the three, $400 range, 
Uh, I have 500 on there, but really we, we didn't consider anything up that high. Uh, so what we, uh, we ultimately uh, ended up arriving at the iPad. Uh, first and, and foremost there, uh, really the physical uh, attributes. Um, you think about the iPad, there are no moving parts in this. Um, there, um, there is no hinge, uh, which again, if you, if you look at other laptop programs out there, one-to-one um, uh, -one programs, the hinge, uh, on that screen if you use a traditional laptop is probably one of the most uh, common things that breaks. It's one of the fastest things that breaks. Um, we looked at other districts that did that. Their uh, damage rates, I want to say, were up in the, uh, the 15 to 20 percent range, uh, somewhere around there, uh, primarily, again, with that, that hinge in the screen. Uh, it's a very portable device. It's got great battery life. Uh, it's got a lot of useful uh, sensors, cameras, uh, other things along those lines, uh, and it's very self-supportable. Um, and this kind of speaks to the question we had there about, uh, about tech support. Um, how many of you have an iPhone or iOS or iPad? Something? Okay, so from a tech support standpoint, most of you are probably already familiar with, uh, really the, the, the first thing and one of the main things you can do is just restart the device. That generally clears up a lot of the problems. Uh, if you get beyond that, the next step is uh, really deleting the app and reinstalling it. Something's not acting. Uh, and then beyond that, um, really the next support step beyond that is a factory reset. Uh, so iOS, uh, as it existed a year ago, and it's even more so now, uh, has some really great management tools out there uh, for the district uh, for us to be able to control the iPads and enforce the settings we need to, like content filtering, um, age restrictions, um, some of the settings in there. Um, we can enforce those even through complete erases of the device. Uh, so as a parent, as a student, or as a tech department, uh, if something's really messed up on here, um, our basic tech support solution is to go into general settings and hit erase all content and settings. The iPad's completely reset to factory, um, to factory settings. It boots up, and you immediately have to sign back in with your district username and password. Uh, there's no way to get around that. Um, and as soon as you sign back in, it re-downloads all the district software, uh, it uh, applies all of our settings. There's really no way that you can get around that. It's, it's basically impossible. Uh, along with that um, uh, comes the fact that there's really no way to sell this at a pawn shop or get rid of it. Uh, because once it's out of the district and we push the law, set it into uh, loss mode, um, it's basically useless uh, to anybody except a district employee. Um, so at that point, um, really the options are to either destroy it or um, send it back to the district and in talking with other iPad districts um, they've had iPads returned from as far away as uh, upstate New York um, mm -hmm. that that one was left at a rest stop along the highway or something um, but uh, it did make its way back to the district um, but uh, yeah the uh, iOS has some great security features in there I'm so curious yep. how, how did they know to send it back to the district do you have like a little thing yes we, we do All have right, I'm thinking, oh, yeah. we, we have uh, stickers on the back that identify it in addition um, like I said, if you erase it and boot it up to the, uh, the activation screen, it actually okay. says property of Hemfield School District. Yeah, okay. um, even if you plug the, one of the district iPads into iTunes and do a force firmware reset, all that, it will always still go back to Hemfield School District. Uh, there is no way to clear that off the device. You have to have ridiculously super high levels of access at Apple to, um, to clear that off, which pretty much nobody can do except for me, Jeremy, and I think probably Chris could get away with it. Uh, could get away with uh, altering the serial numbers in there. So we do have a sticker that has our phone number on the back as well. Yes. Not that it can't be removed, but as Mike said, if it's cleared and the sticker's removed when they boot it back up, it's going to save property. Yeah. Well, that's so, kind of nice for. It's really nice. It. Yes. Yeah, and so theft is is another one of those things that, that kind of goes back to the uh, the insurance and everything like that. Um, if it is actually stolen. Um, we, we do kind of look at the situation, what happened. Um, we, we as a district uh, have to get a police report. Um, that's kind of the one requirement that we have if something gets stolen. We do have to have you uh, as the parent report it to the police that it was stolen um, so there's an official record of it. Uh, and then at that point, um, you know, we kind of look at, at what happens. If we don't get the, um, the police report back, there is a bill then that comes uh, because at that point we can only assume that Whoever had it, stole it, sold it, something like that. But if we get that police report back, um, you know, we can we can talk through some other options to issue an iPad without the full replacement price in there. Um, so 
the security features in general, we've only had, um, I think, one instance of one really go missing. Um, but fortunately, um, of all the ones that have gone missing, or I should say we've had only one go missing that never made it back um, this year. The, uh, I want to say we've probably had two dozen instances of I can't find it calls that came to the tech office. Now, in that case, again, this is another time where iOS has some really good features. Um, if you've ever tried to use Find My iPhone, um, similar idea, um, the district. Uh, we have to purposely enable that feature. It's not on by, uh, or I should say next year, it's not automatically on tracking you know, where the iPad goes. Um, so if it's at home, we can flip a switch and basically put it into lost mode and, and kind of, you know, we've had a number of times where parents called up and said, hey, I can't find my kid's iPad. And we said, oh, well, it looks like it's in your house. Uh, how about we make it beep and it plays a little sound and then the parent was able to say, oh, well, it's under the laundry basket upstairs. You or it's at the iPhone? neighbor's house. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes. You can. Yes. Yeah, if you go in to find my iPhone, you've, you've got all those tools if you have an iOS device, uh, you can do that. So we can do this, a lot of those similar features. Um, if it's at school, uh, if it hasn't gone home, uh, we can do even better than that. Um, within the, the Wi-Fi network here in the district, we can um, triangulate the location of one uh, if it's talking down to probably around 5 to 10 feet. Uh, anywhere in the dist anywhere in the district. Uh, so if it's in a district building, we'll pretty much be able to find it without any trouble. Uh, if it's at home or if it's out of the district, we can probably tell you, well, it's in your house somewhere, and uh, and then at that point you're on your own to find it. But um, uh, we really, of all the, I want to say, like probably two dozen times, uh, they've all been found. Um, the the trickiest one, or at least interesting one, was uh, at the bus depot over on Harrisburg Pike. Uh, there was one that was left on the school bus. Uh, the network over there picked it up, and uh, we were able to get it back to the kid the next day. Um, so uh, they they really, um, as much as you would think there'd be issues with that, uh, we really have not uh, had anything significant um, in terms of theft or loss uh, this year with the 500 around there. Worth mentioning as well, though. Obviously, the device has to be on and talking to a network for us to be able to, to tell some of those things. If it's the battery's dead, that kind of thing. We can give you an idea of where it might have been last, um, but it has to be talking to a network for us to get fairly specific for you. Okay. Um, along with the security pieces, uh, some other things related to iOS there. Um, it's very well supported in the education market. It's pretty much where a lot of educational, most educational software uh, is being develop, developed out there now. Uh, very deep support for e-textbooks, e-books, interactive materials. Um, and there's a really good uh, approach that Apple's taken, or at least in giving us the tools to um, allow us to manage the device, but still allow students um, some, some free reign over customizing pieces of it and making it their own device, uh, which again was something we were really looking at. Uh, security, uh, I, I kind of touched on a lot of this already, but um, Apple's got a really good review process in there for the App Store uh, for, for keeping malware out, things like that. Um, so. This past year, uh, and this kind of goes to the next slide here, but this past year, um, the, uh, the App Store policy really allowed students to uh, install pretty much whatever they want with the age rating restrictions enabled. Now, next year, it's a completely different process, which I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, even with that case, uh, we still had a lot of good controls over um, if there was a particular app that we didn't want, for example, Skype. Uh, we did not uh, allow Skype to be on there, so after we kind of noticed that some students were installing it, we could blacklist that app and basically make it go away uh, pretty easily. Um, so age ratings, things like that, are pretty easy to enforce. Uh, content filtering, uh, the iPad is content filtered, whether you're here in the district or at home. Uh, it's got its own built-in filter. Uh, if any of you use parental controls uh, on a, uh, an iPad or an iPhone for your kid, uh, you can actually enable the same content filter on there as well. Uh, you flip it on and then we maintain uh, a blacklist and whitelist of sites in addition to the content filter, the ones that are picked up, additional ones that we block. So uh, YouTube is one of the most common questions we get. Um, at the elementary level, we block YouTube uh, on the iPad, even though by default it would get through uh, the filter. We do block YouTube, um, Facebook, Kick, um, I'm trying to think if there's Snapchat. some. Snapchat. Yeah, there's, there's a handful of other sites that we purposely block on there uh, at the elementary level. Uh, even up into the middle school, we still block a lot of those. Um, when we get to the high school um, in another year beyond that, um, it'll probably be a little bit uh, different, but we can really customize uh, the filter level to what grade level we're in. So 
Uh, if any of you have specific questions about an app or a website or something like that, I can answer them. But um, we do keep the, the content filtering pretty well locked down on there, especially at the elementary level. And that's all file integrated with Wallace? Yes, yep, it works in, in and out of the district. There's nothing you have to do. Um, your home, if you join the iPad to your home network, it's, it's still filtered there. There's nothing else you have to do that's on by default. Worth mentioning here, too, he's talking about age ratings. So if you go to the App Store, every app that's in there basically has an age rating to it. Um, and that's left up to the developers and Apple to determine what that age rating is. So some of the apps that he mentioned, um, we have blacklisted so they can't install the app or they can't use the app on their device. The age rating piece um, will determine whether or not they can install that app on the device or not. So. Yeah, that's one of those interesting ones where Kick and Snapchat are rated for like four plus. Facebook, on same way. Yeah. But you still have to be over 18, I think, or 13 or whatever to sign the terms of service. Yeah, you can install it as a four-year-old. So I, I don't know exactly how that works. But um, we, do, we do put some other filters in there to, to kind of restrict what can go. Um, so Apple IDs. Um, this is kind of the next question as soon as we say it's an iPad, people ask about the Apple IDs. So this year uh, in fourth grade, um, we used Apple's uh, under 13 Apple ID program. Uh, which allowed students to install and load uh, software. We created the Apple ID, but they uh, were able to load software through the App Store because at the time, that's really the only way that existed for us to get software on to the iPad. Uh, there was really no other process out there that worked really well to, um, to get software on. Uh, there's obviously some issues with that. If you think about game playing and being off task, uh, that's certainly something we, we looked at and heard uh, from parents this year. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say we've got a different process in place for next year uh, to really address some of those concerns. Um, so going into next year, uh, we're still issuing an Apple ID. However, Apple changed uh, the way that entire process works, and it's a, it's a very different type of Apple ID than uh, the ones you use and the ones that uh, we used uh, this year. Um, so uh, apps are automatically loaded uh, by the district. We have a, uh, a handful, I want to say we're up to about 15, 20, uh, that will just basically preload themselves as soon as the iPad is activated. Um, so if you think about uh, pages, numbers, Keynote, if you're familiar with those, uh, some educational apps, uh, Schoology, uh, what else? All the library apps. The library, the ebook apps, all those will be preloaded automatically. Uh, and then beyond that, um, if a teacher uh, or curriculum specifies a specific app, uh, we load it into our, our own kind of curated app store. Uh, that's on the device that the students can then use that uh, I, uh, Apple ID we've issued them to install. So the full-blown app store as it exists right now uh, really will not be on the, uh, the device. It'll really only be a specific subset of apps that we have uh, pretty much approved to be in there um, for use. Uh, I don't know any other way to really... Yeah, no. This. So this year if a student wanted to they could go in and download uh, a, their favorite game or something like that, or favorite games that they wanted wanted to be able as to use. As long as it met the age restrictions. Right, as long as it met all those restrictions that we put on the iPad itself. Next year will be a bit different. They won't have access to the App Store to just download anything they want to, so it'll be a lot more educationally focused as well. Yeah, so you're looking at a much uh, more education focused set of apps that will be on those iPads for next year. Again, that was one of the, the feedback you know uh, that we got from parents this year and from teachers, but um, I mean, there's certainly some, some downsides to it, but our teachers, I think, have done a fairly good job of, of kind of guiding appropriate use. Uh, but even still, this will be, a, a, I think, a, a better solution going into next year. Um, let's see, anything else? Uh, we do run inventories of what's installed, which, again, will be a little less of an issue next year. Obviously, we don't have any remote control over the mic and the camera. We're not even going to talk about what some other districts a little further east of here did with that, but um, we don't have any ability to control that. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we can put the iPad into lost mode um, uh, and, and remotely track it if you tell us to. That's not on by default, but we can, uh, we can track the lost iPads. Uh, they do check in on a daily basis back to our server just saying, hey, I'm here, here's what's installed on me, um, you know, here's my network address. Uh, so we do get at least some information uh, about where the iPad's been um, just on a regular basis if we ever need to, uh, to work with law enforcement or something like that if it's stolen. So any, any App Store, Apple ID, privacy, privacy questions, again, this is one 
some people got have some really specific questions on. I guess like yeah. as teachers are coming up with new ideas for apps, mm -hmm. they'll tell you, and then you'll put it in this Hempfield app store. Is that something along those lines? Yeah, we're we're still working out exactly what that process will look like. But basically, uh, the teacher department leader, someone initiates that process. Uh, that app will go through kind of a, a vetting, uh, a review, uh, just looking at how it aligns with curriculum, things like that. Um, after that, it'll just get dropped into the App Store. Um, now, a lot of things are already kind of in there by default. We mentioned the, the e-books. Um, the, the Google Apps. The Google Apps, so Drive, Pages, or yeah, Google Drive, right. Pages, sheet, no, Docs, Sheets, and Docs, Slides. Yeah. Um, if you're in seventh grade, uh, we're getting into Office 365, so Word, Excel, PowerPoint, that kind of stuff is all kind of preloaded and approved in there. And VoiceThread, and, and if, uh, if any of you are familiar with a lot of the um, educational, the Web 2.0 tools, a lot of them we've already kind of pre-vetted and, and uh, loaded in there as well. Um, they won't be installed by default, but they'll be available for teachers to use ahead of time. So this year, as teachers found stuff they wanted to use, they could actually download it, the students could download it and use it. Next year it'll be a little bit different where we'll have that process that you talked and, about. And we've been working pretty closely with the fourth grade teachers this year, looking at what they thought was what, what they thought were good apps, and been collecting a lot of that info from uh, not just fourth grade but then the other teachers as they've been going through training. And yeah, we have a pretty good list at each grade level at this point of what apps they're interested in having uh, for the start of next year. Professional development. This is all you want. Um, so just a slide quickly on uh, professional development. Uh, the easy part obviously is to put a device in every student's hands. The difficult part is the professional development, getting them uh, used to using it uh, in a proper manner. Um, and basically what we want to do is make sure we, we take the technology and integrate it into the curriculum piece, uh, which is what they, we want them to have. So twofold here would be the curriculum side of things and then the skills, the necessary technology skills that they're going to need uh, by the time they graduate from Hempfield and building upon those uh, as they move up through the grade levels here at Hempfield. So our fourth grade students right now uh, obviously have been exposed to these devices for a year. Um, they're going to carry a lot of skills with them into next year in fifth grade and build upon them that they've, uh, that they've received this year. Much like next year as we roll out first grade, re-outfit the new fourth graders and the seventh grade, we're going to see the same thing as we move up through. Uh, we've done a pretty extensive professional development plan uh, so far for our one-to-one -one program. Um, it's a phased-in approach, just like uh, we're actually phasing in the iPads, we're phasing in our training as well. So last year in the month of May, we took uh, fourth grade teachers, uh, and we had five full days of one-to-one -one training with them. Um, this year, we have our first grade teachers uh, actually just finished up from the month of April because they didn't have PSSAs during that time frame. So. Uh, we focused their training in on that month, uh, but the um, fourth, or sorry, the fifth and the seventh grade teachers uh, have been in training from January, and they're just finishing up now uh, into or towards the end of May. So they've had basically a, at least a day of training each month as we move uh, through this process. Um, as Mike said earlier, uh, one of the biggest things that we're uh, we're hitting on there is this will take some time. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, it's not a device that you're going to be expected to use all the time in the classroom. Uh, the biggest key here is it's an, it, it, it is a very powerful and useful tool uh, where it fits. Uh, and there's going to be plenty of times where teachers um, figure out where it fits right away and say, wow, I can use it for this. And there's going to be other times where they taught a lesson and go, wow, I, I wish I would have used the iPads for that because it would have fit perfectly for that. Or, you know what, my colleague that I just talked to is using them this way. I really could have used some of that. Uh, and they're going to use that a little bit better next time in their instruction. So it's going to build on itself as we as we move through. And I'll talk a little bit about the collaboration time that we spent with teachers as well. And I think one of the other things we've seen too is in, with fourth grade this year is that teachers are also starting to recognize that within their class, you know, the iPad in a particular app may work really well for a group of students. Um, but, you know, there's another group of students that may still be want to, want to still do things by hand or may still want to use a different app, you know, it's really allowing them to do a lot more uh, differentiated instruction, provide a lot more um, flexibility, focus, flexibility um, to everything. Um, we're taking on all of the training in-house this year. Last year with fourth grade, 
uh, teachers, we actually had a third party come in and do some of our training, but we tweaked that a bit based on feedback that we got. And actually, um, we have three instructional uh, technology specialists that uh, are in, that basically go to each and float during uh, to each building in the district. Um, so that's part of our, our core group, uh, as well as myself, as trainers for uh, the teachers. Uh, and we're doing all of our training in-house at this point. Uh, we do uh, plenty of before and after school sessions as well as uh, release time for teachers uh, for one-to-one -one trainings and a lot of our training obviously moving forward will focus more and more uh, from the one-to-one -one side of things. Um, we do uh, and are definitely looking as we move forward in early dismissal time and in-service time so using some of that time uh, to be able to focus towards one-to-one -one training uh, as well especially as we get into the secondary uh, and bring our entire high school on, uh, on board in the same year. Um, just flipping down through here, I talked a little bit about the, uh, the content uh, piece and making sure it's integrated, uh, and that's what we're looking for is a seamless integration there. Uh, sharing of resources is another big one, and, and we've noticed that more and more as we uh, have rolled through this year and we've had some time for our teachers in fourth grade that had training last year to sit in a room like this and collaborate with each other, actually share back and forth. What are you doing? What's working? What's not working? Uh, and we had some time for them to share uh, those lesson plans and things that they worked on with each other, uh, as well as some final products that, that students have created. Um, so being able to see what other people are using and being able to share resources, because we're all in charge of the same content and curriculum that we want to get through to students. Um, so being able to share those resources. Schoology is another area where teachers are able to share some of those resources and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the Schoology section. Um, digital citizenships listed there in the bottom left hand corner and I see this growing more and more uh, as we move forward and it's one of the most important parts uh, of our program uh, from my perspective. But um, we currently have some digital citizenship um, lessons happening in the district. They're primarily happen happening K-12. to uh, They're happening with our counselors and librarians right now. So that's where those lessons are, uh, are occurring currently and that was prior to one-to-one. -one. We actually started that uh, a couple years before our uh, implementation of one-to-one. -one. Uh, and I see that moving out to classrooms too so that they can support uh, that digital citizenship piece because it's going to be more and more important for students to understand uh, these devices, what they can do and how to use them appropriately, uh, both inside and outside the district. Um, so that'll be growing. Um, question of who we're training, you can see this isn't just a teacher training thing. Um, we are having our administrators, our department leaders uh, trained as well, so we're moving through some of that training and we'll have additional training as uh, we continue down this journey. Uh, teachers, obviously, students, um, parent sessions, uh, we've even started training our substitutes. So as substitutes come in and are going to be walking into a one-to-one -one classroom, it is a little bit different ballgame for them than what they're used to. So letting them know what they can expect and uh, having them walk through some training sessions to see what students are going to be doing in the classroom. So we've started some of that uh, this past year as well and we'll continue to have some substitute training there. Uh, down at the bottom there, I already talked a little bit about this, but instructionally, our instructional technology support specialist uh, from a support standpoint, and they're really the people that are going into classrooms and helping teachers integrate technology into their curriculum, uh, and a huge part of our training program. And then the technical side of things, the break fix, as you said, uh, the support of, you know, if something's not working, what's that going to do for us? Um, our as Mike mentioned earlier, we're doing all of our repairs in-house, uh, so that's a big part of it. And then the student piece I have listed there too, uh, and especially in our middle school and high school right now, we have some student um, support, some student helpers uh, that help us with different uh, technology needs. And I see that growing even down into the elementary, so using them as uh, students to be able to help each other, kind of a first line of, hey, I'm having a problem with my iPad, we might have a group of students that are interested uh, in helping out with some of those things and improve and exploring and expanding that program a bit as well. So as Mike said, from the student perspective, they will actually have as much control over these iPads uh, as we would from a tech department. As he mentioned, deleting an app, reinstalling it, um, updating the iOS, updating the app to see if that fixes the problem, or they can click the erase all content settings just like we would normally do. 
So uh, we do have a pretty extensive uh, PD program. So far, teachers have been very, very appreciative of the time. Um, I think our goal was to get them comfortable um, after you know five days of training uh, for what they're going to, to be walking into next year in their classroom um, with the understanding that it is going to take some time uh, and there's going to be some places where they use it, some places where they don't. Um, and it's, it's definitely one of those things where, uh, where it fits. Uh, so I think the program uh, it is going well. Uh, from a PD standpoint, uh, teachers are, are excited um, about the program. Uh, they definitely see uh, some huge benefits of having tools at their fingertips versus having to go check out a card or go down to the computer lab to do some of these things. I don't know if there's anything I missed that you want to touch on there, but I'll take any uh, professional development uh, training questions that you might have. Uh, really quick, uh, what's been working well? Uh, we've had very little damage, as I mentioned before. Uh, the uh, lovely photo on the right there is actually from here in Mountville. Um, we discovered that uh, the desks in fourth grade in Mountville, Roarstown, and Center Centerville too, I think. Yes. Yes. Have this really lovely sheet metal arm that the desk is the top of the desk is uh, is held on with, and when it closes, it makes this really nice trench through an iPad. Um, depending on where the iPad sits inside the desk. So that was probably the biggest unexpected uh, thing at the start of the year. We had uh, three iPads uh, crushed in the first day. Um, so we, we, talked about, we talked about planning, right? We've yes. had this committee together forever. Um, and this is one of those things that you can't possibly plan yeah. for. We just nicely got all the iPads uh, handed out. The if you think about the first week of school this year, I believe we started on a Wednesday. Um, we got the early pickup. Um, st students and parents picked up, uh, 60, about 60% 60 of them picked up their iPads early in the summer. But on Friday, uh, or, or the first week of school, teachers wanted as many of those iPads out as possible to have a full classroom set to be part of their rules and expectations and everything. So we took Wednesday, Thursday, and half a day Friday and got the other 40% out to classrooms. Friday afternoon, I got my first phone call that we had a cracked screen. Uh, and this is exactly what it was. So uh, we again, our, our repair turnaround time is really good. We got uh, we got things patched up. I think in about an hour or two. Uh, for those students, we they were the students were I think pretty pretty horrified, but we reassured them it wasn't their fault. And uh, we had some some good discussions about keeping your desk organized and the iPad goes on the right side. Um, and we really have not had any problems since then. But. Uh, this is probably the, one of the best examples of things we didn't plan for. But other than that, um, things have been going very well this year. Uh, we've seen increased engagement. Uh, Jeremy talked about professional development. Uh, we've seen the iPads used really everywhere in a lot of ways that we didn't even expect. Uh, even down in, in areas like phys ed and music and, uh, and art even. Uh, you know, we, we certainly went through the professional development and we were really curious to see what teachers would do with it and uh, we've been really impressed with, uh, with a lot of the uses. I think the engagement piece there that he hit on is big as well. Um, we're seeing more and more engagement with students, not just inside of school, but also outside. So part of the piece with Schoology and stuff like that, uh, teachers are responding that they're seeing more and more, uh, in, you know, uh, more and more engagement with students uh, in some of those projects and things that they're working on. Yeah, which which for a fourth grader to me is is actually really impressive that you and again Jeremy's. We'll talk about Schoology here in a minute, but you know, when you have a fourth grader who forgets their homework, what, what typically happened in the past when they forgot their homework? You know, they, they didn't do it that day, or, or they had to, um, you know, they had to make it up the next day. Um, we know a fourth graders, and this is a fairly common thing, they forget their homework. Uh, they get on their iPad, they post to Schoology, I forgot my homework, and someone send me what it was. Uh, another student in the classroom sees that post, they take a photograph of the worksheet on their iPad, post it to Schoology, the student that lost it, downloads it, fills it out electronically on the iPad, and resubmits it to the teacher on the iPad all electronically for Schoology. So for a fourth grader, uh, you know, if with basically no, no uh, prompting from us, um, to see that in a lot of different areas, it's been really interesting to see um, how much ownership uh, that they really take over, over their own work and their own assignments. Uh, it's really cool to see. And from the assignment perspective, there's a couple of teachers that have implemented, normally the students had the assignment books that they wrote down what they needed to do that night or for the week. Um, and we have some teachers that have implemented, one of the students goes up, takes a, pictures of, takes a picture of the assignment board, posts it to Schoology. Immediately all students have access to it. 
so they can download it and they have it on their iPad. Um, they've also gone to the extent of they actually uh, have students take that photo and digitally check off what they've completed. Um, and then some of, the, um, some of the teachers had parents actually sign that sheet. Um, so they've gone to, if they still want to implement that, they can actually hand the iPad to the parent and they can digitally sign right on top of that picture that they've seen it. They know that they've completed all those assignments for that work. So, different way of, uh, of doing it. But. Yeah. I'm going to skip over Schoology real quick because I'm going to wrap up here if anybody needs to get out at 7 and then we'll do the Schoology piece if you want to hang around and see some more of that uh, as well. But um, I mentioned electronic textbooks. Um, our library um, about 40% of our library department's um, acquisition budget for books and everything is dedicated to electronic textbooks. Uh, I forget the exact number of titles. It's in the tens of thousands, I think, maybe. I'm not sure. Not sure. Somewhere up there. Um, available. So if you think about a student with an iPad, uh, they have basically instantaneous access to that entire library uh, at any time. Um, and that also includes OverDrive. So if you have the Lancaster County Library uh, subscription, you'll be able to use that as well. Is that going to include the textbooks for core subjects? Um, at this point, that kind of depends on where or how the curriculum is um, refreshed. So, you know, think this year we haven't had the devices, so there's not really an electronic curriculum out there. That said, though, as we've been purchasing and updating curriculum, um, if it doesn't necessarily, if it's not solely electronic, pretty much everything we're buying now comes with some electronic component, a website, materials. So. Um, as time goes on, you're going to see that used more and more. Um, the, la the bottom icon down there is uh, iBooks Author. This is another really interesting um, component that allows uh, teachers and students to create their own textbooks. Um, you get into fifth grade, uh, we have a program right now where the high school AP something class, I forget which one it is, um, is creating the Lancaster County history textbook that's used by fifth grade. So they're up to now revision four, I think, uh, and basically they have a full 60-some page textbook of Lancaster County history that includes all the text. It's got videos and maps and all kinds of stuff that the high school is basically built for fifth grade. Um, so you're going to see a lot more of that, I think, as time goes on as we kind of look at building our own resources. Um, it's really neat to see the high school kids kind of build those resources. And then obviously teachers are reviewing them and everything, but um, still very neat to see. Is so your pretty much. Do you go fully to electronic textbooks down the road? Uh, or not really? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, we're obviously going to be using as many electronic resources as we can. Um, we're, we're in a library. Um, the physical books that you're surrounded by aren't going to go away. Um, you know, the, we're, we're still going to have a mix of physical and digital materials, I think, for a very long time. I just didn't know if that was a specific goal of the district um, to go fully electronic. I think that the goal as we adopt curriculum is that there is pretty much always a digital component that can be utilized. I, I don't think we're at a point right now where we would turn away from something if it wasn't, um, if it was physical only. I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. But I think in the last two or three yeah. years, everything we've purchased has had a digital component to it, uh, whether that be a textbook or some of the additional support uh, books that go along with it. So. Uh, other apps, Pages, Numbers, Keynote, Google, Office 365, a lot of the cloud services that are out there um, we take advantage of through the, the subscriptions the district has. Um, so again, a lot of that work, if you're familiar with those services, um, you can get into it through uh, a web browser at home. Um, so again, this speaks to if you don't necessarily want the iPad going home or going home every day, a lot of that, a lot of that uh, material you'll be able to access in different ways. Uh, we've looked at apps for science and PE and art and uh, all different areas. Um, and we're kind of excited to see um, what else gets used there. And those apps are apps that we've done training on with our teachers, uh, PD as well. Yeah. Um, using the iPad at home, this is kind of the last one where we get some other questions. Um, uh, the iPad can be connected to any available Wi-Fi network. So if you're at home, if you're on the road, we had one student who spent two weeks with their parents in London this year. Uh, they took the iPad with them, stayed up to date on Schoology, and I think they were only two days behind after missing two weeks of school because they were able to still stay up to date with everything. So uh, that's another kind of side benefit that, that we've actually seen in real life uh, happening here with students that are traveling. Um, content filtering is always enabled. Uh, we do not support printing here within the district, but if you do have a printer at home, uh, that supports AirPrint. Uh, the, the students can print if they're at home. We just don't do anything here at school. 
Uh, keyboards are the other major question. Um, we don't issue a keyboard with the iPad. Uh, we looked at some districts that did. Um, usually about 60 to 70 percent of those keyboards that they gave out end up in a pile in a closet or never make it back. Um, and uh, you know, when we went into classrooms and looked at other districts, uh, you had some kids that were taking notes by hand, you had other kids that were typing uh, with the on-screen keyboard, you had some students that had their own Bluetooth keyboard, and then you had the kids that were using their thumbs in the corner and typing faster than all of the others combined. Um, and that that's, that's one of those really um, personal preference things. Uh, there's nothing that we put on here that restricts a student from using an external keyboard if they really want one. Um, we will have uh, some classroom sets of keyboards uh, that kind of rotate around the building, so if the teacher's doing something that really requires a lot of typing, uh, they'll be available. There'll also probably be some that can be checked out from the library. But, uh, by default, we don't issue keyboards with them. Um, any, any other generic iPad questions? Uh, again, if anybody needs to get out of here at 7, I wanted to wrap up for that. But Jeremy's uh, going to show you uh, a little bit of Schoology and talk about how a lot of these resources are actually delivered onto the iPad. So uh, you're certainly welcome to stay as long as you would like, and we'll, uh, we'll do that uh, demo. It probably takes, what, 20 minutes? If, if that yeah, is. we can even make a lesson. Um, really quick, uh, if you are in, are in, your child is going into fourth or seventh grade, uh, you'll get a letter from us over the summer. Uh, that will have more information about early pickup and things like that uh, going into next year. Uh, first grade, we'll see something at the beginning of the year where we talk more about the schedule. Um, so, uh, but at this point, um, that's kind of where we're at. That's uh, the story on the one-to-one -one program, and uh, we're pretty excited to, uh, to move it forward next year. So a couple things for early pickup would be uh, we have an iPad agreement that needs signed, and obviously the, the insurance fee that we talked about. So. Yeah, and that's all outlined in that letter that comes in like this summer. Do the students keep the same one, say, from first grade? Yes. Okay. Yep. Can yep. you do it this summer? Um, this summer they're not because we have to take them back and swap out all that Apple ID stuff that I talked about to change. Uh, next year, the take home over the summer I think will definitely be an option um, if, you, if you would like to do that. So it's, it's less work for us if you're able to, to um, um, take it home. We don't have to bring it in and charge it, keep it take care of it. Um, so the more the, the more they go home over the summer, the easier it is for us. Well, there, in terms of charging, will there be a cart in each classroom where the teacher can keep them all the, charged? The expectation is that it comes to school charged. If it uh, at the elementary buildings, uh, we do, and we will have something at the middle schools too, we do have um, a four-slot charger in the classroom. Uh, the iPads are generally good for at least two days of, of pretty intensive use. Um, so with those four slots in the classroom, kids charging it at home, we really have not had any issues with that. Um, so even if you forget one night, you're still probably good for the next day and you just get it the next night. Yeah, that was one of our biggest concerns when we did staff development as well. Teachers concerned about them not being charged, but um, that's one of the expectations that they set to begin with. Um, and those really, we, as Mike said, we haven't had any issues with it. Uh, we do have a charging station there that stays there for those that aren't going home. Um, that they can certainly charge it if they need to, but for the most part, um, a student usually forgets the iPad uh, once or doesn't have it charged once, and then you know when they're not able to use it for those engaging lessons that the teachers are using it for in the classroom, um, they usually take care of it from there. So. Right. Do you want to hop on and do some? Sure. Okay. So while Jeremy's coming over here, uh, have any of you signed up for Schoology already? Any of you have older kids? And, okay, so if you've, if you've already signed up, you're probably already familiar with what it is, but um, one of the, the key takeaways from our research in the one-to-one -one program is, I was going to say you're going to be right in front of the screen. So, um, one of the key takeaways was that the device, the, whatever device it is you choose, is really only one piece. Um, you still need software um, of some sort to deliver the instructional materials, the communications, all of that. You still need something to um, deliver all of that to students on whatever device it is they're going to be using. Um, as a district, uh, we've used Moodle as a learning management system for many years. Uh, and after feedback from staff, looking at where we were going with one-to-one, -one, we realized that we needed to uh, change things out uh, and upgrade to a more flexible system. Uh, so we ultimately ended up going with Schoology. Um, again, uh, part of the driver for this was um, the one-to-one -one program, uh, but also we wanted to uh, pick a platform 
uh, that was very flexible, that would not only meet the needs of students, uh, but also provide you as parents uh, with a lot more, uh, a lot more access to the resources and materials that uh, your children are using in school. Um, so Jeremy's going to show you uh, kind of a demo of a course in here. Um, I think from the parent perspective or from the student. I'm actually from the student from perspective, the student but it'll be very similar from the parent perspective. As Mike said, you can sign up for a, uh, a Hempfield ID, which will give you parent access to Schoology, as well as a number of other things uh, in the district. We have an iPad portal our wireless and those types of things. So that username and password will actually give you access uh, to those. But I'm going to show you from a student perspective here today. Uh, it's very similar uh, to the parent uh, perspective. Uh, the only difference, or one of the only differences I should say, is um, that obviously from a parent side of things you'll have read-only access to things. So um, you'll be able to see a lot of the resources that you see here from a read access. Um, you just want to be able to, uh, to participate in the course. Um, so this is, uh, I'm just signed in as student A here, and you're going to notice over on the left hand side I have a couple of different things uh, that I can click on. One of the features that, um, that was a, a key factor in some of our online uh, feedback and our one-to-one -one feedback uh, was a calendaring system. So being able to have uh, a calendar for each course and for a student to be able to see what are the upcoming assignments. Uh, one of the upcoming tests, those types of things, so that they can help keep organized with that. So Schoology has a full uh, calendaring system, uh, and I'll hop into a couple of those in a second. You'll see messages over here uh, as well, so there's, uh, you can have direct communication from the teacher to the student, from the parent to the student as well inside of Schoology. Um, you'll notice that there's a grade symbol up there, and it's grayed out. Um, I don't want to get... Uh, too deep into this, but when you're starting to think of grades, think Sapphire, okay? Um, so when you're thinking about um, a marking period grade, when you're thinking about IPRs, report cards, uh, attendance, those types of things, that's all still going to continue to be housed in Sapphire. Schoology is more the curricular side of things and resources that you'll be able to access uh, to help your student, okay? So as you look up top here, there's a, there's a couple of menus. There's courses and groups. When I click on my courses area here, you'll see two courses that I just created as demo courses here uh, that I'll hop into. Uh, but we also have groups. So a lot of our, uh, especially at the secondary uh, side of things right now, a lot of our uh, athletics are moving over to using Schoology. So uh, Coach Walk with the, uh, the basketball um, Varsity Basketball has created a Varsity Basketball group where students and parents are part of that group. So they can see and get information and updates on uh, practices and, and schedule changes and those types of things as well as resources that he wants to post. And that, and that was really one of our goals with Schoology is that it's not just uh, you know a, a dumping ground for PDFs and, and things for class. It's really um, kind of the electronic version of their life at Hemfield. It's a way to keep in communication with all of the groups, the organizations they're involved in. It's one central place to keep track of all of that. Um, not just on the district issued iPad, um, there's also smartphone apps on uh, iOS, Android um, that you can sign up for. Uh, a lot of our high school students already do that, so they get push notifications directly to their phone um, when there's an announcement in dance theater or something like that, or there's a new assignment posted in their course. Um, and uh, as parents as well, uh, again, Jeremy mentioned um, those uh, athletics groups. Uh, parents can also join those groups as well. So if you're curious about what's going on in the, you know, with the football team, uh, you can sign up for that Schoology group and be getting notices on when practice is canceled, things like that. If you use your own personal smartphone, join that group, you can get push notifications sent directly to you as well. To sign up for Schoology different than to sign up for Sapphire? Are they two different? They're two different things, yeah. And we'll mention, we'll talk at the end about how to sign up for Schoology. So I just hopped into uh, my math course here as a demo course, and as Mike said, you can get push notifications. From the student side of things, uh, I'm on an updates tab here, and you can see as the instructor, I can post different updates here uh, that students can see and information that they'll get in those uh, notifications as well. So I can always see what's going on. Uh, we have a fair amount of our teachers right now using the updates uh, side of things. On the left hand side you see materials here uh, and the materials is where you'll start to get into some of those curricular items uh, that you can have access to to help your, uh, your child. Now I just have a, a smattering of different things that you'll see in here uh, but we're in the process of 
uh, building some consistency to this or a framework to this so that uh, as you as parents and as students are starting to log into these courses, you'll start to see things more organized by theme, by units, um, as well as uh, an information folder there that might contain at the secondary syllabus information, how to contact the teacher, those types of things. Uh, so we're walking through that right now to start to, uh, to organize this even more. Uh, but I just hopped in here to, uh, to some of these folders, and you'll notice that I have a couple of folders at the top here. Uh, this one here has a link. You see the chain here? It's a link actually to another website. I'll show that in a second as well. These uh, sections down here are actually assignments. So as the teacher uh, creates an assignment and has some information in there for the students to do, they can actually take the document or the assignment, download it to their device, work on it, and then they submit it electronically back to the teacher. The teacher can then grade that electronically, they can tie a rubric to it, and submit it back to the student as well. From a parent perspective, you'll actually be able to see what they submitted, and you'll be able to see the feedback from the teacher as well. So I've had a couple parents call me this year and say, Mr. Paul, I want to be able to see what my student submitted in that personal financial literacy class, or in that fourth grade class and I can actually walk them through on the screen where they can go and they actually see the document that the student submitted. Um, and then after it's graded, they can see that piece as well. Um, so it is a pretty powerful tool the whole way around. I'm just going to, okay. I have a question. Uh, a lot of teachers have blogs. Does this kind of take the place of blogs? This has a blogging piece as well. So we're in the process of some of that today. So, that's, so one spot, one spot. That's our goal. This is one of those one kind of shopping. transition things. <laughs> yes, one spot to go to because For all three of my kids. Yeah, you're gonna see. This is gonna so be. Like 10 teacher blogs sound too good to be true. Yeah, <laughs> this is really gonna be the primary tool for communicating anything in class to the students, particularly once one to one gets going. And we've been encouraging teachers. Well, the secondary level, we've been moving them over to this for the last two years. Uh, at the elementary level, this was the first year. I was going to say, I think my daughter's in the seventh grade. I think she used that. I mean, she's done some blogging, which is really neat. Do, is that, do you think that's why, what, where she, I mean, I don't know, the teacher posted a question and they blogged. Yeah, that was, it. It was, that's probably it's a discussion board. It was, it's, I'm sorry. That's probably from Schoology. There is discussion board. It looks boards very familiar yes. to me. Yes. So, and you make a good point. Over the past several years, we've had up to 10 learning management systems. So, especially when you're talking about secondary, a student can go from period one where the teacher is using Moodle to period two where the teacher is using a wiki space to period three where they're using Edmodo. So you can see how difficult it becomes for a student to figure out where to go to get resources, um, let alone a parent, right? And then layer a student of special needs in on top of that as well. So our goal was to try to get to a one-stop shop, as you mentioned, uh, try to narrow that field. Schoology was one of those platforms that took all of those platforms, or a lot of those platforms that teachers were using, and had a lot of those features. So that's why we're trying to funnel it into uh, basically one learning management system. So you as a parent, when you log in, whether that student's in first grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, or the high school, it has the same look and feel and format to it. And, and the biggest thing is really once one-to-one -one gets to a particular grade level, there's that much more driving everything being funneled through Schoology. So if, you have a, if you're going to have a kid in sixth grade you know, next year or the year after, you're not going to see quite as much in the Schoology front at that point because they're not one-to-one -one yet. Um, but as soon as those devices are out in every kid's hands, this is really the, the primary tool for that communication back and forth. Yeah, I have one this year and then two the following year. And worth mentioning too, I'm showing you on a laptop and a web browser here, but even as a parent, if you want to download the app, you can log into it as well. Um, just a couple quick uh, items here, um, and then I'll take some additional questions. I just want to show you a couple things. So these are all websites that the teacher has posted. Uh, this is a fourth grade, so there's different uh, websites that they uh, have suggested that student can go to to practice different things. So if I click here, uh, and actually open this website, it'll take me to the extramath.org site um, where this is probably a site that they've been using in class as well. So the teacher can list some of those different uh, websites to go to uh, for different help or different practice uh, with what they're working on. So that's just a, a list of those different sites there. Um, the next folder here, classroom materials, is uh, some things that you'll start to see when I talk about units. So you'll start to see Unit 1, Unit 2, Unit 3, and then inside there you'll start to see some of these documents. 
Um, I just called mine Classroom Materials because it's not an actual class, it's a demo course. But as I click here, here's a PDF file, um, and this is just steps to divide. So this is a, a document that our fourth grade teachers use um, to help students um, know and remind them of how to divide. Uh, so it's a simple thing that they go through and a resource that they use. Um, the cool part about this is the teacher does some teaching here, um, they, they work through and have some of these resources, and then one of the assignments that the teacher did was, okay, use your interactive whiteboard app, Doceri, to show me how to divide. Not only does the student then walk through and write on their iPad, as you can see, but they're also voicing or having a voiceover so that they can talk through and explain what they're doing in the problem. So when I hop back over here, these are just some uh, PDF resources inside classroom materials. There could be Word documents, there could be pictures, uh, you name it. You're going to see a, a lot of different resources that teachers post in there. Could be, um, could be uh, PowerPoints, could be Word documents, um, you name it. Uh, could be videos in here as well. Teachers are able to post videos in here for uh, either videos they made in the classroom or link out to others. So there's a lot of uh, options for teachers here uh, to be able to post stuff inside these, uh, these folders. As I go back out here, you're going to notice that here are the assignments that I talked, to, that I talked about. So uh, this one is to teach me how to multiply and divide. So this teacher created an assignment after they did instruction and said, okay, using Doceri, record yourself explaining to the teacher the following. Create one slide and all of the steps to divide. So they walked through what they needed to do. Just to give you a quick demo of what it looked like from the student side of things, this is a student uh, product where they took the math problem <coughs> digitally and walked through. So I'm just going to fast forward this a little bit, but you can start to see that document that I just showed you and the students actually walking through um, those different steps and then she goes on to actually do the, uh, the division problem here okay, let's go and explains it while she's doing it. And is going to be one of the apps on every laptop I assume. So I'm just going to fast forward here, but you can see she's working through this and she's doing the explanation as she walks through. You can see her marking off the different items uh, as she walks down through this problem. Uh, so she finishes this and actually submits this video back to the teacher as the assignment. The teacher can take this and see how the student did on it, can mark it up, can actually give them audio and video feedback if they want to in reference to this assignment. So uh, not only can they tie a rubric to it, uh, and mark it up, but they can also post audio and video uh, feedback if they want to as well. So a pretty powerful tool. Uh, I just wanted to show you that piece uh, just real quickly. You can see over here on the right hand side that the student can see the assignment that they submitted. This will be very similar to what you see as well. Uh, so I'm on the right hand side here. If I click this, here's the actual video uh, and that you would actually be able to play or see as a parent document, whatever it might be. Okay. Um, I'm just going to hop back out here real quick. I wanted to show you the calendar feature real quick. This calendar is specific to this math course. Right now you don't see anything in the month of May that was due because when I created this it was a couple months ago uh, for another uh, session that we did. But when I go back to the month of March, you can see these are the assignments that you saw on that main page and when they were due. Okay. So anything that the teacher puts in here will actually put on a calendar for them. It's specific to that course, so they can go to each course and see what's going on. They also have an overall calendar that they can see every course on it as well. Anything else you want to add? Uh, one of the other, just it's worth noting, you asked about if the iPad's not going home or parent family doesn't have internet. Um, one of the things that we did talk a lot about in, in professional development, or we do talk a lot about, is you know making the assignments flexible based on the situation of the student. Um, and you know, obviously, this uh, this was a great example of really how to, to make everything of, you know that you can possibly do with uh, with the technology. Um, the teacher that may have that did that assignment may have worked out something else if the kid wasn't taking the iPad home. Maybe they sat down with the student while the other students were doing something in the classroom and, and came up with another way 
uh, to do that evaluation. So we do talk a lot about being flexible and how the assignments are organized and created. Um, obviously, we want to utilize the technology wherever we can uh, to get as much benefit from it, but we know that we have to be flexible in how things, um, how, how assignments are done uh, based on the situation. At home. The other thing worth mentioning there related to that is that even if a student didn't have internet at home, this particular assignment would be one that they could actually do. They could use Doceri at home, they could actually work through this problem, and then once they got back into school, they could actually upload it to Schoology and submit it to the teacher. Any other uh, Schoology questions? Uh, I think we had one back here. Did you have a question earlier? I did. I almost think you kind of answered it, but I, I, I will ask anyway. Okay. For parents who, uh, like for me, for example, I use YouTube a lot for refresher courses for my kids when they have homework, and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. saying. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Will that help us as well? Will we be able to utilize that? The schoology, the program that you're just showing, can we? Because it kind of looked like you just did that anyway. Absolutely, that's that's now, one of the whole. we have questions too, could we submit it to the teachers as well, saying, "I know you did this, but I'm still not familiar." Yeah, if you have if you have a parent account, you can send a message to the teacher. I, all of our administration will tell you email the teacher anytime you have any questions, but yeah. um, you can certainly do that. Um, obviously, if you have the one, to, if you have the iPad at home, you can sit with your your child and go through all those resources, look at everything. And that's, again, one of the really great things with Schoology, all of that is there the entire year long. So if they've gone through that unit, that lesson, you can go back to it at any time, replay it. You don't have to worry about the piece of paper getting smashed in the backpack and yeah. lost forever. Yeah. Um, and we have some teachers doing that right now where they're creating videos or they're linking the videos that directly relate to their instruction that they're working on for that day or that week or whatever it may be. So that, that topic area. Um, they're definitely creating instructional videos and using their. We have a couple teachers that are playing a little bit with a flipped classroom where they create a video for students to watch or see uh, at home uh, and then come in and they get a little bit uh, better direct instruction with groups of students as they work through and figure out what students are struggling with, what part of that concept. So, this Schoology will be a huge resource for parents uh, moving forward, but what I will also say is this takes some time as well. Okay, so from the teacher side of things, Mike said at the secondary, we've had this available for two years, so they've been developing and starting to get things uh, organized in their Schoology site. They don't even have the devices on the student side yet. Elementary, this has been the first year, uh, and I will tell you that it's, it's something that, that takes some time and, and grows, but I will say the second half of the year, we've seen a lot of growth with our fourth grade teachers using Particularly in the video side of things, math, I think we've seen a lot of examples of teachers talking through doing math problems in a video format and uploading that because it is a great way to review a lot of those concepts. That's from fourth grade all the way up to calculus in, in high school. We've seen some, some videos up there as well. And the goal here would be having the teacher link to those videos or producing those videos instead of you having to go out and try to search for something. So. <laughs> so do you have to sign in separately to that, or if I go on the parent portal, does it kind of connect there, so they don't talk to each other? Correct. Two They're two separate, separate systems. Two we tried really hard to make it work, but it, it wasn't going to happen. So, yes. Yeah. Um, so you'll get information on signing up for a Schoology account uh, with that letter as well. Um, we do have, and I'll just hop over to it here quickly. My first grade parents, can you get that letter? See, well, the, um, the school of GPs you can sign up for now. The the um, the letter about one to one and everything will probably be it'll probably be a like in that first day packet that goes home because yeah. we're not going to start the first right. day of school with first grade. But um. so we do have a one to one spot here under academics on our on our website, and we'll continue to post more and more resources up there. Uh, those letters that go home get posted up there as well as some video and stuff like that. Under operations, we have the technology department here, and on the left-hand side where it says parent access, this will kind of give you some additional information uh, about the parent access, um, what is contained in Schoology, and what is contained in Sapphire. And we can do the search, too, because when yes. I get home, I won't remember that. Yep. If, if you want the really, if you want, if you want the really quick one sentence about signing up for Schoology, 
Just call the technology office at 898-5596. Yep. That's all you got to do. It's it's actually a much faster process than Sapphire is. Um, we basically verify your info. Uh, we get a username from you. Um, you get an email back with some instructions. You click the link. You verify your account, and that's that's basically what happens. Um, so the process is just call the tech office, and we'll get you set up with the account. What's the number again? 898-5596. And that's, that's in the instructions on the page, too, but all you need to do is just call the tech office and get your account set up. It's down here at the bottom. Yeah. Have you had a lot of parents yet signing up this year, or is that something to see more? Yeah. Um, so we do have a station during early pickup that they can actually fill out a Google Doc to get them started as well. So those of you that will end up doing early pickup, you'll have a spot there that you can sign up. But as Mike said, you can set one up right now if you want to. Just know, depending on what grade level your student's in, you might not see a whole lot. Uh, depending on how much the teacher is using it at this point. It's not a username or password that's going to expire or anything like that. So. And it gets you on the Wi-Fi in the district if you already do want to. So. Can Schoology be used between districts? Because like I have an account through Lancaster School District because we use it. Like can mm -hmm. I use my login in from like no. Unfortunately no because we don't have access to your account to associate it with our okay. kids. Unfortunately, now if you're a district, I don't know if anybody's a district employee in here. Yeah, um, we can link your kids with your account, but we can't do it with another district. Yeah, awesome. yeah, that's the only downside. Sorry. Right, one more question. How about um, the teachers in the grades that don't yet have the one-on-one, -on -one and they're not getting the one-on-one -on -one next year, like eighth grade? Are they use Are they trained using Schoology or not? We've been strongly pushing them in that direction. Um, we've basically said that um, Moodle, which is the previous LMS, is not going to be used next year. Um, your choices are Schoology. That is your choice. Um, so, uh, yes, I think even in eighth grade, you're going to see plenty of Schoology usage. Now, it's not going to be quite to the depth that one to one grade would be in, but I think you'll see it used a decent bit. And at the high school, they haven't been, I mean, they're not in one, one for another two years. I, we've seen lots and lots of use up there as well. And there will be some Schoology training at the start of the school year, so I would say, as Mike said. Yeah, yeah. as, as yeah. more and more teachers are exposed to it. And it's more do it, and then they talk to each other. Yeah. yeah, eighth grade, you'll definitely see it. I think sixth is probably the, what will be one of the last ones to, to come on just because of where they fall in that cycle. And I will say to the middle school's credits, they've used um, Sapphire a lot to post assignments and they stuff have, like that. Yeah, uh, so it's a matter of transitioning them over to, to school. Yeah. Other question? I'm more on the one-to-one. -on -one, but could you, for the folks who have an iPad at home, mm -hmm. could you talk about the benefits of like, signing up to have your kid bring one home? Like uh, the apps that you download use them across multiple device, devices, is the information stored in the cloud or is it specific to that iPad where you start something at school, can you come home and sign on to our iPad? Most of what we use, um, at least the productivity apps, if you will, um, so pages, numbers, uh, Keynote, all the Google apps, all the Office apps, they're all cloud-based. So you can sign into a browser, you can sign into another iPad. Schoology is obviously cloud-based as well, that's going to run on everything. Um, a lot of what we try to do is very purposeful in that it is accessible on multiple devices. Um, so to answer your question, if you have an iPad at home, you're probably 90-some percent of the way there. Uh, the difference would be you're going to have to go out and hunt for any educational apps that we would probably be forcing to install on an iPad. Um, we do obviously focus a lot on free apps uh, that are out there, but you're not necessarily going to know or get those delivered to you automatically. Um, but a lot of the, the applications, the documents that they're working on would, would transition back and forth. Okay. Uh, the other benefit is, obviously, we're going to be purposely refreshing those every three years automatically um, to keep everything up to date um, so that, you know, there's one less iPad you have to buy. But, you know, that's, that's up to you. We do try to make it um, as convenient as possible to move between devices, though. Okay. Thank you. I apologize. It's kind of an individual question, but will my district issue iPad have the same ones as my son's iPad, like the same apps as my son's iPad. You know what I mean? So that there's uh, no reason for us to have two at home. As a, as a teacher, um, you don't have the restrictions that we place on the student ones. So there's nothing that 
But I mean, automatically, will mine have all the no. apps? No, so we don't, to go out we, and get them. you'll have to go out and get them from that's the yeah, we don't auto, There's very few things gotcha. that we automatically okay. push to staff. In fact, I don't think there's anything to force, Correct. force to staff at this point. There's a whole other set of Apple ID things that you'll be hearing about at some point. But it's I mean, staff have some of those app restrictions, those Snapchat and those things that we have blacklisted. Yeah. But beyond that, we don't push anything. Yeah, there's some there's some fun staff tools we didn't even talk about tonight, but you'll see those eventually. Any other questions? One to one or Schoology or other ones? Was this was this helpful for everyone? Good information? Yeah. Feeling a little little happier, safer, I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> it's not the end of the world. Okay. And I would say, you know, as as we go down the road, if you have additional questions, definitely reach out to us. Uh, we've had a number of uh, people with questions that we cut down on. Question. Yeah, um, I noticed you guys were mentioning a lot of special needs programming and such. I, mean, I have a special needs learner in the high school, and she doesn't have any iPad or access to it other than when she's in the classroom. Where are they going to get them? The, the high school? Yeah, she's uh, the, in the high school now. The high school is um, the year program. after next. Okay, so. so Basically, the way we've we've been dealing with um, special ed, we treat just like every other student in that particular grade level. So, um, fourth grade this year, we included special ed. All of them are along with all the other fourth graders. So, uh, if you have a student at the high school, regardless of what programs they're in, they'll be included in the entire high school when it comes online in two years. Okay, so she's got to wait two years to get one. Yes. Okay, so what do I do in the meantime for her? I have to use the one I have at home, but it's not going to not going to let me download whatever apps or well, the, well, that's that's really up to how the the IEP is defined and what arrangements you've made with with special ed. Um, you know, if there is something you a specific goal we are trying to achieve with technology, that's really at this point, just like any other grade level, is really a conversation between you and and the special ed department um, and what you want to achieve. That we have special ed students. Um, we have gifted students in a number of different areas that do different pieces of technology. Sometimes it's an iPad, sometimes it's something completely different. Um, at this point, that's really driven by the needs of the student. Um, and, you know, you're going to see, obviously, uh, once one-to-one -one gets to that grade level, it's going to be a little bit easier to bring those, um, bring those things in, try different applications. Um, but right now, it's really driven by what special ed and the parent has worked out uh, for the needs of the student. Okay. Thank you. So, if you do have questions, I'd encourage you to talk to special ed. They've got... Uh, well, they told me to talk to you guys. Because <laughs> I emailed them and told them I was coming tonight. And they were like, well, okay. I said, I said, okay. Yeah, I, if they're at the high school, they will be included when the whole building comes online. All right, so, so that's two weeks. Yep. Thank you. Well, we'll stick around if you have any questions. But again, thank you for coming. Uh, and I hope it was uh, informative for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.